I did my last year of intensive care training here in Melbourne and I still remember a patient that we looked after. He was 18, he'd been playing basketball and he fractured his ankle. Um, he had an orthopedic surgeon put a screw in that ankle and he was discharged the next day. And he was discharged that day with a box of ox oxycodone, like these tablets up here. Um, and as like 18 year olds might do, he had um, went out to a party and uh, had some misadventure with that um, box of tablets and some alcohol and had a respiratory arrest. He came to us and basically left our ICU about a month later in a persistent coma, um, which is probably the worst outcome you could have thought could happen. Um, so I think we will talk a lot about different things today, but this has clinical relevance and personal relevance to lots of us. And uh, a, a story illustrates how this, um, for us, is, is an important issue. So this is really interesting. Like, if you go back through the, the recent history of um, uh, sort of modern medicine, at least, and pain, from the under-treatment and under-appreciation of pain through to the other, other end with the pain becoming the fifth vital sign. And the pendulum has been swinging in both directions. Um, and maybe we've swung a bit too far the wrong way. Um, and what I'm going to present is not uh, groundbreaking or new. Other people have done this work. Uh, actually, what we, we did, we borrowed a bit from the Alfred. But this statement from the Society of Hospital Pharmacists, uh, Choosing Wisely, Opioid Wisely from Canada, and you know the, the Australian Pain Faculty Medicine have their own items on opioids already. Um, so I'm a hospital-based doctor, uh, and you know we know that people come in, they ha have painful conditions, um, and we want to treat that pain. But like many things we do, we're not very um, judicious about how, how we look at that once they leave our care. So almost half of patients who leave hospital with opioids haven't had any in the day before leaving. And some of those will go on to be, who are opioid naive at presentation to hospital will end up to become chronic users. And this is where it's interesting, there's not much evidence actually to help doctors tell them how much to give people. Um, and so there's, you know, obviously we've seen the, the st stats in the US, but you know, the stats in Australia as outlined on this slide aren't great either. And the Atlas of Variation from last year showed that 15 and a half million prescriptions for opioids in Australia seems like quite a lot. So, <coughs> One of the things you say is, well, how many tablets should we give someone? There is no literature out there, absolutely not one paper. This is the only paper that's been done, which is a sort of attempt at a consensus statement from America, where they tried to work out the range of tablets you should give someone. And the most interesting outcome from this study was that people who had undergone the procedure thought that they would get le needed less tablets than the people prescribing them. Okay, so. Um, obviously, people who are prescribing it haven't had that procedure done to themselves. So we thought, well, this is interesting. We'll look at this. So we audited you know, our sort of uh, main areas of discharges for the hospital, and we asked some of those questions that came up before. So how many people were opioid naive that we were sending home um, on tablets before they presented? 61% of them were opioid naive. Never had a tablet before. General medicine, actually, that was quite low. Um, often they had sort of many more chronic problems. How many had we been giving simple analgesia? You know, there are alternatives from pharmacology. We were doing pretty good. How many had opioid use in the re recent 24 hours? Actually, again, we were doing pretty good. They were, they were getting tablets on discharge. How many had the pain service involved? So they're the experts in the hospital. Only a third. I've put a tick there, though, because they can't see every patient in the hospital. They're supposed to be there for the sort of the complicated ones. But then how well are we doing at sort of translating that information from when the patient leaves to the GP or to the patient themselves? So there was actually not a documented weaning plan for tablets that we would expect in most of these patients who didn't take them before hospital should be stopping at some point. Um, we were trying to sort of work out, you know, what are the consequences of this? The downstream effects are probably some time in the future. Um, but we, we found that a third of patients had some constipation, you know, a small number had falls, a small number had readmissions. So the attributable harm in a short period after hospitalisation is quite difficult to, to ascertain. 
But we're sort of interested in this concept of you get a box of something when you leave home. Everybody gets a box of this and a box of that. And you probably don't need a box. Um, and so how many were we giving you know, a tailored amount, you know, five tablets, ten tablets? And so that only happened in 16% of the patients with the doctors actually thinking, oh, this patient needs less than, than what the PBS quantities are. <coughs> So we're working with this information to uh, change um, expected prescribing uh, information for the hospital in that weaning is expected for these tablets. These are things, are things that should be stopped. We're also trying to work on giving an expected timeline for recovery. And that's the last bit there. We, we've, um, we're working to actually ring up a whole series of patients to find out how many tablets they took after discharge. How long was it there? Because the we're telling people you probably need less, but we don't know. We don't want to undertreat people's pain, but we don't want to go in the other direction. And so if we knew on average people needed opioids for three days after discharge, we could say our baseline population gets three days. And more than that, they should go and see their GP. Um, we're also working on that communication issue, creating stickers for the weaning plan. So it's really interesting. Our pain service writes a, a, a letter for every patient that goes home but they don't give that letter to the hospital. So that wasn't being documented by the junior doctor who was writing the letter to the GP. So we're trying to fix that. Um, the other thing is unexpected benefits. So the medical patients that I looked at, uh, some of their prescribing habits were rather bizarre. And so I presented it at one of their meetings and we've re-audited them since then. And their habits have changed completely and we haven't done anything except for one presentation. So there is an amazing amount of um, information that can be fed back that changes people's behaviour because they want to change, they don't want to do the wrong thing. We haven't tried to tackle chronic pain and de-prescribing because we think we have you know, a lot more to start with uh, in the early stages. Um, and when I give this talk to people at my hospital, I say everybody prescribes opioids, anyone who's a doctor, and what you do every day matters more than what you do once in a while. I'm going to stop there. Thank you.